I'm very pleased to welcome Emily Aiken to give today's talk that Emily is someone who we've known for quite a few years that we attempted to recruit here, her as a graduate student several years ago that she went to UC Berkeley. She's at the Berkeley High School right now finishing her PhD with Josh Blumenstock that her one of her main results was on the cover of Nature. She will be describing that work. So without further ado, I would like to introduce Emily, that she's expressed interest in having questions during the talk as well as at the end of the talk. So feel free. Cool. Um, well, thank you. Thank you so much for having me. It's super Great to be back at UW, I'm really happy to be here. Um, yeah, like Richard said, I'm pretty happy to just take questions as we go, and if it gets to be too much, I'll try to kind of keep us moving along to make sure we don't run over time. Um, like Richard said, my name's Emily. I am a final year PhD student at UC Berkeley. I'm in the School of Information. Usually I have to kind of explain what that is, but here you have an iSchool, so you kind of know what Schools of Information are all about, but my research kind of lies at the intersection of problems related to development, so ICTD or development economics, and then taking techniques from data science and machine learning to try to address these problems. Um, my plan for this talk is I'm gonna sort of give you a very brief background on the area that I have worked the most in in my PhD, which is questions around poverty targeting and the targeting of humanitarian aid. I'll try to explain how that relates to both ICTD and to machine learning. Um, I'll then do a sort of deep dive for like most of the talk on one project that I think gets at the heart of like a lot of the different types of research I've been doing and that's this big project I did with the government of Togo on targeting cash transfers during the COVID pandemic using machine learning and digital data. And then at the end of this time, I'm gonna try to briefly highlight like a few newer projects with like one slide each so that we get a sense of sort of the breadth of my research but also go super quickly. Um, with that, let me dive in. I'm guessing many people here probably have not sort of encountered this niche research area of poverty targeting before. So just to give you the broad motivation for my research, basically governments, NGOs all over the world want to run humanitarian aid programs. They may even have budget to do so and they may even have a large budget to do so. On average countries spend 13% of their GDP on humanitarian aid and social protection programs. But the pretty much like quintessential problem that these governments and NGOs face is that they don't have enough budget to help everybody. So they have to do some form of targeting. They wanna make sure that benefits are going to the people who are poorest and likely need them the most and not going to people who are less poor. Um, in developed countries, so like for example here in the US and much of Europe, this is typically done through means testing. Who here has heard of means testing before? Yeah, so means testing is pretty common. The idea is to use administrative data on income to identify who should be eligible for uh, benefits. A good example of this would be the stimulus check program in the US. Who knows how the stimulus check program was, was targeted? How did they find beneficiaries? Yeah. They looked at like your IRS. Exactly, so they looked at the tax returns, I think it was from like the previous year, and then households or people with below a certain level of income were eligible for benefits. That works pretty well, it's not perfect. I can talk more about the limitations if people are interested. But my focus is on low and middle income countries, I'll often abbreviate that to LMICs, where typically this kind of comprehensive and up-to-date data on poverty is not available. And there's basically two reasons for this. First, in low income countries, typically a lot of the workforce is employed in the informal sector, so they're not paying taxes, they're not in the tax net, and so there's not like a useful record of their income based on tax returns like we have from the IRS. You might say, okay, we don't have like admin data on, from taxes on incomes or on poverty, but what if we like went household to household and collected poverty data in a large survey or like a full census sweep of the population? This does work. In fact, some countries do do this, but typically the poorest countries are also the ones where census style data is least available and the most out of date. So I think this recent World Bank study that I'm showing a table from here found that like of the poorest countries in the world, something like half of them haven't conducted a census in the last 10 years, let alone a census that contains information on poverty. So a lot of countries are basically in the setting where they want to give out aid, but they do not know which households are wealthy and which households are poor and therefore who the benefits should be distributed to. So my research seeks to fill this data gap 
leveraging novel digital data sources and advances in machine learning. My research, very broadly, I kind of see it as like falling into three sort of overlapping buckets. So this poverty measurement, poverty targeting question is at its core an ICTD question. So I identify very closely with the ICTD research community. But a lot of the methods I'm taking to that question are more from the data science side rather than most of ICTD has traditionally come from the HCI side. And then lastly, the more that I've like worked at this intersection of ICTD and data science, the more I've found that this brings up some of the really critical problems that come up in sort of data science and society settings in general. In particular, I've worked quite a lot on privacy, transparency, and fairness in this setting. So this third bucket of like sort of AI ethics and how it manifests in my work has become increasingly important to me, and I'll, I'll give some examples of research there towards the end of the talk. Um, so I've done a lot of research in these various buckets. I'm going to talk through them, some of the sort of like the sort of broad overview of research a little bit later, but I wanted to start and spend most of the time in my talk by going on a deep dive into one project that really gets at kind of the heart of all three of these themes. And this was this big deployed project, again, working with the government of Togo to build up a cash transfer program using machine learning and digital data for targeting. Um, this is the paper I'm talking about in this project. Um, it's joint work with a number of wonderful co-authors. Um, and so I'm going to start by giving you just like a little bit of the backstory of the project because it's kind of interesting. So this was a project that took place during the COVID-19 pandemic. So COVID hit Togo in like March 2020, roughly. Um, the government in response, sorry, and Togo is this, this country in West Africa, in case that wasn't clear. Um, the government basically very quickly rolled out this entirely digital cash transfer program in an attempt to offset the sort of worst economic impacts of the pandemic for the most poor and most vulnerable people in the country. Um, this program was pretty interesting in that it was entirely digital, so this is pretty unusual and from an ICTD perspective kind of exciting. Um, instead of sort of handing people out cash, people were registered for the program via their mobile phone. So if I was like a Togolese individual and I wanted to register to receive cash, I would dial a short code on my mo mobile phone, worked on both feature phones as well as smartphones. Um, and then if I was eligible, I would receive the benefits via mobile money transfers. You can think about this as like Venmo for, smart fo for feature phones, basically. Um, eligible individuals received roughly 13 to 15 US dollars per month for five months. That's about one third of the consumption poverty line in Togo. So it's a fairly substantial cash transfer size for Togo. Um, and just as like a digital artifact, this program rolled out fairly effectively. It got about 1.5 million registrations in a country of 8 million people, 4 million adults. So that's quite, quite a high registration rate, I would say. But the big challenge facing the government of Togo, and as I kind of set up at the beginning, is that Togo is one of these countries, I think 10% of Togolese are on, have tax records. Um, the last census in Togo was conducted, I believe, in 2011, and it did not contain any information on poverty. So Togo is one of these countries where there's really not useful information on poverty to use for targeting an aid program like this, this program called Novisi. Um, so that's where the government of Togo got in touch with me and my research group at UC Berkeley. Um, and I ended up actually having probably a very unusual COVID experience relative to others in that I ended up spending most of the pandemic in Togo working directly with the government of Togo and this NGO Give Directly that I've done a lot of work with um, to actually roll out this cash transfer program and help them design and evaluate an approach for targeting based on machine learning methods. So let me get into what exactly this targeting approach was that we designed. Basically, we came up with a two-stage targeting approach, both stages based on digital data and machine learning. In the first stage, we aim to select eligible areas of the country, um, so which sort of areas of the country were poorest that should be eligible for this cash transfer program. The challenge here is that not only did Togo not have like an up-to-date census, they in fact didn't even have like an up-to-date survey that was representative at a very high geographic granularity. So this map I'm showing you, the cantons of Togo, we were aiming to select roughly the poorest 100 cantons. So cantons are outlined in gray here. And you can see that in this survey, this is the most up-to-date socioeconomic survey in Togo, um, it wasn't even representative at the canton level. So there's many cantons that have no observations at all or very sparse observations. So we couldn't really use this to generate like a poverty map as sort of would be traditional in economics to select cantons for eligibility. So we turned to the literature um, on using satellite imagery to infer poverty. And the intuition here is really that satellite images contain all kinds of information that is predictive of poverty. You can think about like um, the material of household roofs, the material of roads and their density, 
the size of households, access to water, access to green space, farmland, all of that is visible in satellite imagery. It's just a question of how do you extract it and then use it to infer poverty. And so of course this becomes like a perfect supervised learning problem, particularly because we can use this sample socioeconomic survey as training data. And so we had sort of labeled training observations for roughly 500 tiles covering all of Togo. Um, Togo, in the, for this particular satellite imagery data source we were using, is covered by about 10,000 tiles. And so this 500 tile labeled training data set can be used to train a machine learning model, in this case using a convolutional neural network, to predict poverty as observed, like the ground truth poverty is collected in the survey from the satellite images. Um, this is like the really high resolution poverty map that is then predicted where poverty, this poverty predictions are measured in consumption expenditures, US dollars per day. And then we aggregated those together to uh, infer poverty at the canton level and the poorest 100 cantons were eligible for benefits. Questions so far? Yes. One of the questions during, right? How many questions during? Let's do it. I was just curious, does them being called cantons reflect a particular colonial history? Like to me, I think Switzerland. Yeah, so I, it's a French term, I believe. Actually, I don't know if France itself has cantons, but I think, yeah. Um, so Togo was well, actually briefly German and then French colony. Yeah. What's the scale of the map, like size? Um, so each of these tiles is about two kilometers by two kilometers. If that helps, I couldn't actually tell you how tall the map is exactly, but Togo is quite a small country. I mean, you saw it on the scale of West Africa. Other questions? Yeah. Can you say a bit more about how the surveys were collected? And like, yeah, how fair is it to try to reproduce that if, if there could be any bias in that in the first place? Absolutely, yeah, great question. Um, and I'm gonna talk a little bit more about training data collection in a, actually, oh no, I'm not gonna cover that project. Never mind. so I'll talk about it now. Um, so the survey that we worked with for this part of the pipeline, I'll talk about a different survey in a second that we used for the second half of the pipeline. So these are two different surveys, which will, will come up again. Um, this survey was collected in 2018 and it was collected by Togo's statistical agency. So it's like, like many low income countries, Togo has like a socioeconomic survey that happens every roughly four or five years and they sample, um, in this case, it's about 6,000 households for the survey. Um, I think a few things that are, so I, maybe I'll say some of the good parts and some of the bad parts, we'll do it that way. So the good things about this survey, the data is quite high quality. Um, they collected very detailed data on consumption expenditures, which are pretty much the gold standard of poverty in low income context. Um, and we did quite a bit of analysis to suggest that this data is, is pretty reliable. Like I have high confidence in the quality of the data. Uh, the, the downside, and actually maybe two downsides that I think are important to note. The first is the sampling of the survey. So you can kind of see it on this map, but the survey is cluster sampled, meaning that they selected like a neighborhood or a village and then sampled households within that neighborhood or village. That means that the survey is, while it is nationally representative, we don't necessarily have representativity of all areas of the country. And so while we did do some fairness evaluations that I'll show a little bit later, we can't necessarily generalize them to like all parts of the country as much as maybe one would like to. Um, and likewise, in terms of training data representativity, while it is nationally representative of the whole country, like there are parts of the country where there's basically no sample and you can see that up here. The other comment that's worth noting is the time horizon. So I said it was collected in 2018. The satellite imagery we worked with at the time was from 2020, I believe. Um, and so there is this like time gap between the two. And so I'll talk about this one. This one I really will cover later on, but I think there's a lot of interesting questions here around distribution shift and model drift and whether, you know, maybe a two year time gap is okay, but we don't really know. Nobody's ever actually studied how these like temporal gaps between training and features affect models like this, at least in this setting. And so something I'm really interested in, and I'll talk about some related work that I'm doing now, is thinking about how these time horizons, how much these time horizons matter. And like, of course, and then when we deployed this, it was 2021, and so that's another year of gap, and maybe, you know, if it gets reused in 2025, you might start to get worried. But when should you get worried? We haven't quantified that. But that's something we're excited about. Yeah, but I think it's broadly, a huge thing in this whole literature is like thinking about the sampling of training data. And I, I think that's a lot of the exciting machine learning stuff I want to do has to do with that. So I'll talk about a bit of that later on. Yeah, so I'll do one more and then I'm going to keep going. Yeah. So for, uh, with these 100 canta, about portion of the population actually was in these eligible areas? Yeah, great question. Because um, it's not at all, I, mean, you can't, I don't have a map here to show it, but like 
population distribution is not at all uniform in the country. In fact, if you look at, if you had a population density map here, you'd see like much of the population concentrated in the capital city, which is right there, and much less in these rural areas. Not surprisingly, the most rural areas are also the poorest areas. That's not necessarily true everywhere, but it's very true in Togo. So in fact, the population in these cantons is like, it's quite low. I believe it's about 500,000 in the selected cantons. Yeah. Cool. I'm going to keep going, but if people want to come back to the satellite imagery, I'm also happy to do that as we go along. Um, so after we'd selected these poorest 100 cantons, um, there was still a lot of policy interest from the government, and also just due to the budget constraint. There wasn't enough budget to pay everybody living in those poorest cantons. And so um, we turned to trying to do a level of individual targeting, trying to figure out who in those cantons is poorest. Again, no really useful data to do this, so we turned to using mobile phone data to predict poverty at an individual level and then use that for uh, uh, sort of determining an individual eligibility, eligibility for cash transfers. Um, intuition here is basically that phone use is predictive of poverty. So if you think about sort of how you use your phone, it's likely that wealthy people use their phones very differently than poor people. Um, I'm showing one example here. This is actually from a different paper that I wrote in the setting of Afghanistan, but this is just showing the number of active days that subscribers used their phone over the study period, which is about 200 days. And you can see that like, generally, non-poor people tended to use their phone for a lot more of the time than poor people. That's what this kernel density estimate is showing. This is broadly true for like, a lot of other aspects of how people use their phones. Poor people might tend to make fewer calls than rich people. Um, poor people are more likely to be using a feature phone and therefore not be using any mobile data, whereas rich people tend to use more mobile data and less like just SMS and calls. Um, mobility can be really important as observed through cell tower usage. And so again, this is a case of like sort of having this like vast digital data trace of mobile phone records and wanting to use it to infer poverty for, uh, for, the, for sort of a full population when we don't have poverty information for the full population. Um, the challenge here again is basically, well, I guess it's really two challenges. The first challenge is accessing mobile phone data, because unlike satellite imagery, mobile phone data is not publicly available. So this is like this type of data, mobile phone metadata, is basically the information that mobile network operators record in their day-to-day -day activities. So like basically when somebody places a call on a mobile network, the operator will typically record like phone number one calls phone number two, this duration at this time, and it went through a particular antenna, like a particular cell tower, which gives you some very very vague notion of mobility. It's not very high resolution. Um, but these data are proprietary and held by mobile network operators. Um, so we signed data sharing agreements with both of Togo's two mobile network operators to obtain these data. Um, and they provided us with data for roughly six months before the rollout of the program. Um, and so, um, I, sorry, I kind of already covered that first part. Just to give you a sense of the scale of this data, um, we had data for roughly 6 million subscribers in Togo. So of the 8 million people in Togo, there were 6 million mobile phone subscribers. Collectively, these data contained roughly a billion calls and texts, and also a large number of mobile money transactions. So we also observed mobile money exchanges between people and also uses of mobile data. Um, this just gives you a sense of like, what these raw mobile phone records look like with, of course, the, the phone numbers pseudonymized. How do we actually use these to like, predict poverty in a useful manner? Once again, it starts with a labeled survey to use as training data. In this case, we needed to be able to match the survey data to the mobile phone data. And so we conducted a new survey of roughly 10,000 subscribers. It was conducted over the phone because it was the COVID pandemic. Um, and in that survey, we spoke to people for about 20 minutes and ascertained some measures of their poverty, including an estimate of consumption expenditures. We also asked for informed consent to match that, their survey responses to their mobile phone records. Um, and so we were able to, for every survey respondent, match their actual poverty as recorded in the survey as they self-reported to the, uh, the information recorded about their mobile phone use. Um, and so from that mobile phone data, we then calculated roughly 1,000 features describing how each subscriber uses their mobile phone, everything from mobility to calls to contact networks to mobile data usage and so on. Then, of course, it just becomes a supervised learning problem. So using these 10,000 subscribers that we had uh, actually interacted with through the interview, we were able to train a machine learning model to sort of pick your favorite supervised learning model. We kind of tested 
all of them, of course, um, and then to predict poverty from our features derived from the mobile phone data. And then we can, first of all, of course, like evaluate how accurate this approach was, and I'll talk about that in just a second. But then importantly, we can predict poverty for all of the 6 million mobile phone subscribers in Togo, not just the 10,000 that we had actual poverty information on. OK, questions on this part of the pipeline before I move on to evaluation? Yeah, Rick Room. Yeah, quick question. Um, it looks like, do the blue circles there indicate where the surveys were done? Because it seems like they're mostly concentrated in one part of the country. And you mentioned most of the population is further south. Is that a choice? or? Yeah, we did this because we tried to focus the surveys in the areas where the program was going to be run. So it was already in these like 100 cantons that were selected. There's actually some trickiness and some interesting sampling aspects to that because we didn't know in advance where people lived. So we attempted to infer the general area of each subscriber based on which cell towers they were using and then sampled based on that. So our survey was not perfectly restricted to these cantons, but it was, it's generally focused in those cantons. Other questions? Cool. Um, so I want to focus now on thinking about how to evaluate the accuracy of these targeting approaches. And so this is sort of like the main, I guess, research contribution of this paper is thinking about how accurately were we actually able to identify the poorest people using this mobile phone data machine learning approach? And how does that compare to like other targeting approaches the government of Togo or others could take? Um, this is like going to be super obvious, but just to make sure we're all on the same page about how we're actually evaluating accuracy in this setting, um, we're going to use our survey that we collected, an out of sample, of course, portion of that survey. Uh, to run this evaluation. So here I'm showing all the predictions for that portion of the survey. On the x-axis, I'm showing the actual consumption is collected in the survey. And then on the y-axis, the predicted consumption as based on our predictions from mobile phone data. And you can see there's like clearly some relationship here, like our predictions are doing something, but it's obviously not perfect. Um, but we don't really, I mean, whatever, Spearman correlation is sort of helpful, but what we really care about is, you know, accuracy for identifying the poorest individuals. Yeah. A log scale or something. Yes, yeah, log scale. Oh, yeah. <laughs> um, where was I? Yeah. So like, we don't just care about the sort of correlation coefficients. We care about how accurately we're able to identify the poorest people. In this case, the program had budget to pay the poorest like 21 percent of individuals living in these areas, and so I'm focusing on this 21 percent cutoff. We would love to find the 21 percent poorest based on actual consumption, but all we can observe for everybody is these predictions based on phone data. So we're going to target the poorest 21% based on those predictions. So of course, some people are going to be correctly included. Um, but there's also going to be some exclusion errors, uh, some inclusion errors, and then a large portion that is correctly excluded. Just one quick point I think I want to, was worth making here before we go into the next slide is that you can see in this setting where it's like a quota evaluation setting, inclusion errors are exactly equal to exclusion errors. I mean, you can think about that if we accidentally included one person in the program, that must mean that one person was incorrectly pushed out. So I'm going to actually show just one evaluation metric for inclusion equals exclusion errors in the coming slides. Just want to clarify that because that's a common point of confusion. Um, in terms of thinking about the accuracy of this algorithmic approach, I want to compare to sort of alternative targeting methods. Like I think it's really important to consider like, you know, what is the accuracy in comparison to like what would have happened otherwise, the status quo approach. Um, I'm going to compare to two methods that were feasible in Togo during the pandemic. And because, again, because it wasn't really good poverty data available, those basically were phone-based targeting, our main method, and then geographic targeting. What if I just paid everybody living in the very poorest areas of the country? I'm also going to compare to some methods that were not feasible in Togo during the pandemic, but are still really interesting because they are going to be feasible in a post-pandemic world or are feasible now in a post-pandemic world and are very sort of standard poverty targeting approaches in low-income countries. That's basically methods that rely on primary data collection. So actually going to households and collecting some small amount of information on poverty. This is a fairly standard poverty measurement and targeting approach in low-income countries. Typically you collect like a short poverty scorecard survey of like 15 to 20 questions and then use that to approximate poverty or consumption expenditures or income. I'm going to show two different ways of doing that called an asset index and then what economists call a proxy means test. These rely on the same underlying data but an asset index is basically unsupervised learning and then a proxy means test is supervised learning. So learning a model to actually predict poverty from this scorecard. Lastly, just kind of as a reminder, my gold standard measure of poverty is going to be consumption expenditures as collected in uh, the survey we conducted. And then lastly, this goes back to this two surveys point, I'm going to actually do two evaluations. First, I'm going to show you 
an evaluation f based on the survey we conducted that is focused in uh, the areas of the country where the program was actually run. And then second, I'm going to show you an evaluation based on a nationally representative survey that allows us to simulate sort of what this would look like if the, uh, the program were scaled up to the whole country. All right, so finally getting into the targeting evaluation. So on the slide, the left bar shows precision and recall, so very closely related to exclusion and inclusion errors. The right bar shows an area under the curve score. It's calculated very slightly differently from a traditional AUC in machine learning in the sense that this, you can think of this AUC as representing sort of the, 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 the curve that simulates all hypothetical targeting thresholds. And by that I mean we had budget in this program to pay the poorest 21% of households, but that could have been the poorest 50% or the poorest 70% or the poorest 80%. So this curve basically shows the like true positive rate, false positive rate trade-off for all hypothetical targeting thresholds. So it's just, it's very, very slightly different in that we don't have like a binary ground truth here. Um, so left side, precision and recall, right side, AUC. The red bars are showing the geographic targeting approaches, so those would have been feasible during the pandemic. The right bar is showing, the, sorry, the green bar is showing the phone-based targeting approach, so our method we developed. And then the blue bar is showing this approach, an asset index that would require going household to household and collecting survey-based information on poverty for all households. Um, what we were kind of surprised to see was that not only was the phone-based approach better than like a simple decision rule based on something like geography, in this setting it was actually even better than the survey data that was available. I think I can go into some reasons for this. Part of it is that the survey data was quite limited in this setting, and so it wasn't like the world's best asset index that you were comparing to. Um, and that's true across both the metrics. And now to show you this evaluation of a hypothetical national program, I like to show this evaluation as well, even though it wasn't, we never ran this program nationally. Um, I do think the like, survey data that was used for this evaluation is somewhat higher quality. As I mentioned, it was collected in person rather than over the phone. Um, and so I, I think this is maybe a slightly higher quality evaluation in that sense. Here we see that the phone-based targeting approach shown in green is better than like, simple decision rules based on geography, again, but not as good as using an asset index or a proxy means test, so like going in person and collecting high quality data on poverty. Um, I'm happy to take questions on this, but I'm gonna quickly just talk through kind of my finishing up slides for this project, and then I'll take any questions before I move on. Um, I guess I briefly wanted to just talk about sort of the scale and impact of this work. So this work was sort of high profile during the COVID pandemic. Um, this aid program, Novici, I think became a bit of an example to like other countries that were trying to scale similar efforts. So we got like a bunch of press attention. And since this project in Togo, which was the first project ever to use machine learning and phone data or satellite imagery, really any of these like digital data sources to target aid, um, a number of other countries, governments, NGOs have adopted similar approaches. So really immediately thereafter, the World Bank ran a very similar program in the DRC. Um, I've since worked a lot with Give Directly in both Bangladesh and Haiti, and I'm now starting to work with them in Malawi on a similar project. So it's certainly the case that these types of targeting approaches, which were previously sort of only existed in research, are increasingly being used in real world aid programs. And I, I feel like that only to me, that like only makes it more and more important to start to think about some of the concerns that you or I, I mean, I certainly have these concerns, might have about targeting aid through these machine learning and digital data approaches that you might not have about like more traditional, say, geographic targeting approaches or like going in person and collecting survey data. So I'll just mention a few of these that I think are particularly salient. The first, of course, is digital exclusion. This is the idea that like, you know, people without phones are likely to be the poorest, and if you're using phone data for targeting, then you're not gonna, those people don't even stand a chance. Um, in Togo, this was, I guess, less of a concern because they were already running the aid program via mobile phones, and so there wasn't like additional exclusions created by using phone data for targeting, but in future programs that seek to replicate this model in other settings and aren't necessarily tied to using phones as the delivery mechanism, this becomes really salient. Just to give you a sense of how this breaks down in Togo, 85% of households, according to survey data, have a phone in Togo, but that's down to 65% of individuals and only 43% in rural areas where the program was run. So this really is a first order concern. Um, also, I, I maybe many of you or any of you who work in development probably know this, but sort of this assumption that like phones to people are one to one in this setting is like not very realistic. Um, and so there's typically sort of ubiquitous phone sharing and sometimes multiple phone ownership in low income countries. Um, and so 
uh, there's a lot of questions about how to sort of resolve like the data which appears at the phone level to the aid program which we're seeking to run at the individual level. Um, I actually have I actually have a sort of separate paper that looks at phone sharing in the setting and also looks at the impact of cash transfers on phone sharing um, that I published at Compass a couple of years ago. So I'm happy to talk about this more if people are interested, but for now I'll just flag it as like a potentially interesting problem. Um, what else? Privacy is obviously a first order concern. So phone data contains private and potentially sensitive information about contact networks, mobility traces. Um, and so uh, there's a number of really important and also really interesting questions about privacy in this setting. Um, we took a number of privacy safeguards for this project that I won't go into unless people are particularly interested, but I will flag that there are some really interesting ongoing research directions on privacy that I'm working on right now, um, including both sort of from the technical side, thinking about options for making these predictions differentially private to protect the training data, and then also from the sort of more human HCI side, some, some HCI research on privacy that I'm gonna talk about in just a second. Um, Fairness is a big deal, so we have a bunch of fairness audits in the paper. I'm not gonna go into that in too much detail right now. Um, I think also one I'm very passionate about and have talked with a few people about at least today is algorithmic transparency in this setting. So how can we think about making sort of more complicated algorithmic eligibility rules transparent so people know why they are or are not eligible, which feels like really important to sort of dignity in this setting without incentivizing manipulation or enabling manipulation of the decision where people can start to make their you know, data look like something that should be eligible. And then lastly, there's like a bigger bucket around sort of technocracy, power, function creep. Maybe we feel okay about these types of data being used in this setting for targeting aid, maybe, but it's easy for sort of that to slide into less good uses. And so there's also a lot of, uh, a lot of really important questions there. Um, okay, I'm gonna pause here because this is kind of the like midpoint or like the point at which I'm gonna stop talking about this paper and start talking about some other papers with some brief highlights. So I wanna pause now for questions or thoughts on this part of the talk. Well, the percentage of people that do not have a cell phone, does the poorest exist in that? So, how, and did you look at that, I mean, in the paper? Yeah, I mean, we were able to, stu to study it with survey data because we have Surveys, again, like slightly out of date surveys. It's like from 2018, so not perfectly up to date. That's where these statistics come from. Um, and I don't, I might have it in like a backup slide, but I, we, did, we did look at it. And indeed, phone ownership is very correlated with poverty. It's also very correlated with gender. So women tend to own phones less than men. Also correlated with age. The elderly are less likely to own a phone than like younger people. And so, I mean, it basically goes in exactly the direction you would expect. And so, I mean, I think a big thing I've talked a lot with partners about post this project is like, how can we set up alternative options to get into the safety net if you don't own a phone? Um, and so that's actually something, it's not a current research project, but I'm really interested in thinking about like, how should governments and others allocate resources toward these like digital ones versus like non-digital options for people who are, uh, who don't own a phone. Others, yeah. Um, when it comes to like individual, you know, phone data, was there any concerns or considerations for, say, people who use their phones for like business purposes? Someone who is an individual user but then runs an informal business and as such you probably see a high number of like mobile money transfers. Yeah, so we didn't look at that. There was no like specific, I mean, it was just a supervised learning algorithm, so it wasn't like a specific carve out for that population. Um, that being said, I think two comments worth noting. The first is that uh, people were free to register on like whatever phone they wanted, but one phone person could only register one time and they had to register their like national ID number. And so if I, you know, you could choose to register on your business phone. If you had a separate personal phone, you could also choose to register on that phone. Um, the other comment is I don't have it, I don't think I have it here, but in a different project we've started working on um, in Bangladesh, we've been able to do some like heterogeneity analysis or some, I guess, also kind of like fairness audits in their own way of like, is this algorithm working really differently? We didn't look at like business phones particularly because we didn't ask people in a survey whether their phone was used for business, but we did, we were able to ask like, is this phone shared? Um, is this phone like just belonging to you or does it get used by other people? And we could look at heterogeneity and like accuracy of the algorithm on that dimension and didn't find a ton of evidence that it was doing worse or better for phones that were used by a lot of people. But it's another good idea for like a dimension of basically a, f a fairness analysis, a fairness check. 
Can you talk a little bit about how you would um, use some of these methods if you have a more uh, sort of multi-dimensional criteria than just the poorest? Like you want to also target the poor and a particular segment. Uh, for example, in the Grameen Bank case in Bangladesh, it was women who were, you know, the best kind of in terms of uh, returning those micro loans. And so, are there ways to finesse that kind of uh, criteria, the optimization criteria? If you want to call it that. Yeah, that's a. It's funny you ask that. I. Um this is not my own work, but people, my, including my advisor and some others like Dan Bjorkegren at Columbia, have been working on almost exactly that setting of like microloans. So here we were working on cash transfers. The loan case is a little bit different because in the loan case, you want to make sure you're not only paying people who it will help, but also paying people who are going to pay back, right? So it becomes this like multi-objective optimization problem where you can actually think about like, first of all, wanting to target that like, intersection of people who are both going to pay back and are going to be helped by some sort of social welfare metric by the loan. You can also start to think about trading off those two metrics. So like, if I'm willing to give up, you know, if I'm the company and I'm willing to give up X dollars of profit, I can buy myself helping this many more people. And perhaps that could incentivize like, more sort of charitable lending, maybe. But um, it's really interesting work. I can point you to the paper, but this is not my, not my research. If I understand correctly, uh, your precision recall is around 40%. Yep. So this means that uh, rough, roughly half of the people who got money, Work they correct. got it incorrectly. Yeah. And half of the people who should have gotten money, didn't, uh, they didn't get it. Uh, so does, does this create any animosity inside the society? Because you know, yeah. if you look at your neighbors, most of your neighbors are on the wrong side. Yeah, no, it's a really great, great question. And I think, I mean, also just to highlight, I, mean, I agree, like the precision and recall are super low. But then you look at the other alternative methods and they're not really that much better. And so we're, we're working in a world where like it's a really hard problem of finding the poorest people. And so just to say, like, I, I mean, I agree they're super low and like, so this is like a very, basically it's a low prediction accuracy regime that we're working in. Um, to the question about animosity, I'm gonna use that as an opportunity. Actually, I'll just talk about it and then I'll go into the next, uh, the next part. Because um, it, it does come up in, my, in one of the follow-on projects. Um, but I, it's a super interesting question. And it's not something that people have worked on a ton. But in the econ literature, and also from an HCI perspective, there's a little bit of work on like cash transfers and social cohesion. So does selectively including only some people in a cash transfer program create negative social dynamics? And I think the answer is generally yes for like targeting cash transfers at the individual level at all. Um, sort of forgetting about the eligibility criteria for a second, just even only selecting some people will tend to create jealousy. It might create stigmatization of beneficiaries. Um, and it might create sort of general, general negative effects on social cohesion, that's been shown. Um, in this particular program, we actually got to uh, do some pretty cool follow-on research. I'm just, gonna, I'm just gonna skip to it and then I'll come back to this because I just wanna say it now with the slide. Um, so one of the projects I was excited to talk about in terms of sort of ongoing and follow-up work has been that we actually worked with a qualitative researcher who's also a PhD student in my program. We had the opportunity to go back after the aid program was run and talk to people and sort of do long form qualitative interviews with about 100 people um, in rural Togo who either registered for the program and got aid or registered and didn't receive aid. And we talked to them about a number of topics. Um, we talked to them about privacy. So like what are your expectations of privacy around using things like phone data to target cash transfers? Um, we also talked to them about and this is more to, to your questions, we talked about, about did you understand the eligibility criteria? Like, did you know why you were eligible and your neighbor was not eligible? And also tried to work on methods for how we can explain these algorithmic eligibility criteria to people. And so these pictures down here are showing we developed these like visual aids to help people, especially people who are like really have little education, might have low levels of literacy or digital literacy. It's really hard to explain to people in, in general, but especially low education people, how these types of like sort of what phone data is and how these types of algorithmic eligibility criteria are, are being created. And so we developed these like visuals to help explain what phone data is and how these are being uh, used to determine program eligibility, which was, was really, really cool to see these working. Anyway, and then lastly, we asked people about how the cash transfers had impacted social cohesion in their communities and their relationships with their communities. Um, very briefly, just to sort of complete the answer to your question on this, this social cohesion question, um, I think people did definitely find that there were like negative social dynamics from some people receiving the money and some people not receiving the money. And a particular thing, and it's really interesting from like an HCI perspective that came up a lot, is that a lot of people who, especially women, especially the elderly, who are less familiar with how to use their mobile phones, 
would ask others for help with registering for the program and receiving aid. And so there was this like a lot of sort of intermediated sort of registration happening for this aid program. And then when this other person, you know, you give them your phone and they, then they, you know, registered you and then it says you're not eligible, then they had to explain to you why you weren't eligible. And that created a lot of sort of animosity. People would accuse each other of stealing the money, for example. Um, and so I think that's like something I'm really interested in getting into from an HCI perspective is how this intermediation between the sort of end, end user and the program um, has complicated the social dynamics in this setting, especially because this is like one of the first big digitized cash transfer programs out there. And a lot of governments are looking to not only use these algorithmic eligibility criteria, but more generally digitize the delivery of aid in their settings. And so I think these types of how this impacts social dynamics will become more and more important. Um, I know that was a very long answer to your question. Sorry. Um, Sure, why not? This might be outside the scope of your work, but sort of thinking about a corollary to the second question, I'm curious if there was any, any piece of this that was about sort of people challenging or formulating alternatives to the eligibility criteria that they think would be more just. Yeah, so we didn't get into that in too much in this particular setting. Um, there's, a, there's more of a backstory to why that ended up being a difficult thing to go into in these interviews, but it's something I would, I would love to study more. And also thinking about if we can develop methods of recourse that are like, like even like say we're going to go straight into this phone data thing, like this is the way we're going to do it. Can we think about developing me methods of recourse that feel really meaningful to people? So they feel like if they are being incorrectly classified, they have an opportunity to protest that, I think is a sort of like smaller version of what you said that I'm interested in also. Cool. I wanted to finish telling you guys about this project and then I'll sort of go backwards in my slides a little bit. Um, but so we've been, we did these qualitative interviews last year and are kind of now only now sort of sorting through the data and starting to get answers to these different research questions. But the one we've looked at the most is privacy. And I think this was super, super interesting to me. So I just wanted to share a sort of snapshot of the results with you. This is a paper that we sort of have only finished and just submitted. Um, and I think what, what was, what struck me a lot is like whenever I give talks like this one, people asking about privacy, for sure, because phone data, again, contains this really sensitive information. There's a lot of sort of, and there's, there's literature out there from privacy experts on and the primary concerns that are raised in that literature often kind of like power and surveillance driven, right? So people are worried about uh, sort of re-identification and reconstruction attacks that you could do with phone data, like how much information that phone data could reveal about people to powerful actors like governments that could do, you know, really bad things. Um, we talked a lot with people on the ground about what sort of their privacy concerns were. And we were really excited to do this because while there's all this literature out there about the potential privacy risks of phone data, to my knowledge, there's not really a lot of work that has talked to the people who are most impacted, like literally the data subjects themselves, who the data belongs to in the first place. And while, they, while some people identified with these like surveillance concerns, concerns, for the most part, the concerns that people raised were more relational. Like they were really concerned about what kind of information this data could reveal to like their neighbors or their household members. Um, and sort of the ways in which this data could reveal especially like financial information about themselves and also limit their autonomy, especially when shared with household members. And so there's this kind of like implicit privacy protection that comes with distance and that like the government is really far away and couldn't harm me based on this data in the same way that my neighbors could. Um, so I thought this was like a really interesting result and not at all expected. Also, I mean, I think I was talking with somebody about this earlier, but I don't take this to mean that like, you know, the only concerns we should be worried about are the concerns raised by the people on the ground. Presumably we should kind of be thinking about solutions that can address all of these various privacy concerns. Um, okay, I've gone a bit out of order, so I'm just gonna go back here because I wanted to take a moment to kind of give you a sense of the breadth of my research. And then I was gonna highlight three projects that followed up on this work in Togo, one of which I've already done. So the good news is we only have two to go. Um, but I wanted to briefly kind of highlight the breadth of my, the kind of work I've been doing. Um, and so again, a lot of my work is motivated by these questions around the targeting of humanitarian aid. So I talked about the big project in Togo. I've got a couple other that are kind of projects that are kind of in the same bucket of like big intervention projects running real world aid programs and then evaluating the accuracy of the targeting of these programs and thinking about uh, sort of uses of new data and machine learning methods in these settings, but like really deploying projects. Um, I also feel like so on the data science side, the, I, something I really like about the way my research has worked is that the constraints of this like poverty targeting setting have raised some really interesting 
sort of more general machine learning questions that I might not have identified at the outset as something I wanted to work on if it wasn't for like the fact that the constraints of this setting really make these really salient concerns. Um, I think I already talked a little bit about training data labeling, but this is like really salient in the setting because basically I'm typically collecting my own training data and so every sort of survey that I have to conduct is taking budget away from the rest of the program, taking budget away from money that I could be giving away to beneficiaries. And so it becomes this really interesting setting of like how many, first of all, how many labels should we conduct, collect to train our machine learning model? When should we stop and save the rest of the money to give away as benefits? And also like who should we sample, right? So it's like a perfect setting for active learning. So I've been doing some work on that. Um, I'm also, and I'm gonna highlight this one, uh, doing a little bit of work around uh, distribution shift and model drift in these settings. So like poverty is actually a very dynamic measure. I've talked about it as static today, but in fact it's changing over time constantly. And so issues of model drift and distribution shift become really important in thinking about how well these models for poverty prediction will generalize over time. Um, I've also done more work sort of on the ICTD side, especially looking at how we can use these digital data sources to measure the impacts of uh, interventions in, like, like cash transfer is intended to help people. Um, and then lastly, I mentioned on this bucket of privacy, transparency, and fairness, I've increasingly been working in this area. I would like to keep working on it for sure in the future. Um, I already talked about the sort of more qualitative work. I also have more quantitative work in this area, um, including some work on uh, sort of fairness evaluations on the satellite data side, and then also looking, like I mentioned, starting to look into formal privacy guarantees on the mobile phone data side. So I see I only have five minutes, so I'm going to highlight one more paper, but I wanted to just take a pause and see if people have any really pressing questions from anything else I've talked about so far. So I'm happy to also not highlight more papers if people would rather ask questions. Cool? Okay then I have the perfect amount of time for one more paper. I did want to highlight something that's more on the machine learning and data science side of my work. So um, I'm going to talk about this model drift and distribution shift, which is something that's actually ongoing. I'm working on it right now. And so I'm also really eager to talk about this and, and discuss it with anybody who's working on related research. Um, but like, if I can sort of sum up the main result from our Togo paper, paper I talked about for most of the talk, it's basically that phone-based targeting, this phone data machine learning approach, um, was sort of better than things like geographic targeting and other feasible options, but not as good as going in and collecting poverty data to use for poverty estimation, in particular this thing called a proxy means test. Um, for background, a proxy means test is basically uh, using a short poverty scorecard survey, like typically something like 15 questions, information about, say, like, material of a household's roof, how many rooms does the household have, do they own a car, do they own a bicycle? So it's like this really short, easily verifiable scorecard survey. And then they actually train a machine learning model to predict either income or consumption expenditures from that poverty scorecard survey. Um, this is actually super, I think, interesting by itself because this was done, it's been done for like the last 30 years. Like it's a really major use of machine learning in government policy that gets largely not studied in my view by computer science community. Um, and, and it's really widely used. Like, it's, this is the sort of most standard poverty targeting approach used in 50 plus low and middle income countries. Um, and you'll see many evaluations of how accurate this approach is, but what all of these evaluations pretty much ignore is this major issue of data refreshing. And so, um, in this setting, as well as in many sort of predictive targeting settings, the data necessarily necessary to predict household poverty and the data necessary to cal calibrate the model is only collected every like five to eight years on average. And so there's this huge gap where you know, data isn't being collected and we don't really know what's happening in terms of actual poverty status in the interim. So what happens when a model, when a, the PMT proxy means test becomes out of date? There's really sort of two phenomena that happen at the same time. And the first is model drift, basically the machine learning model that we you know, learned five years ago no longer represents an up-to-date relationship between these features that are collected in the scorecard and ground truth poverty. Um, at the same time, we also have covariate shift happening, right? So also the data that we collected five years ago no longer reflects the on-the-ground reality for what these various characteristics look like for a household. Um, and so I've been doing work using publicly available survey data to try to quantify basically how big a deal is this? How big a deal is it that these data are going really out of date? This is using data from six different countries. Um, and from, from these six different panel surveys, we have like 
data for the same households for many years in a row, and we can actually look at if a model was trained five years ago, what does it look like using that model today? Um, and you can see there's like a lot of sort of heterogeneity across different countries and different surveys and what this looks like, but for the most part, there is a severe cost to allowing these data to go out of date. In fact, for every year a proxy means test goes out of date, R squared drops by an average of about 0.06, and targeting errors increase by about two percentage points. And that's relative to typical targeting errors at the beginning of being about 30%. So this is like a major phenomenon that's happening in the background that sort of the main studies on proxy means tests from econ and from computer science aren't really studying. And so, um, I mean, one question you might ask and a reasonable question is like, okay, so how out of date does the proxy means test need to be that we should start looking at using like phone data, satellite imagery, some of these newer methods? And it seems to be, I mean, it's hard to say because we don't have data from Togo in the study, we don't have data from those countries in the Togo study, but it seems to be something like seven to 10 years. Um, what I'm really interested now, and this is the last sort of thing I'll talk about in this talk is, and again, really eager to talk about with people who are working on related methods, is like, this seems like somewhere that we should be able to take some tricks from the domain adaptation literature and start to think about whether we can design machine learning methods that are mo more robust to model drift and more robust to covariate shift over time, right? Um, and so I've sort of been doing a lot of work on the sort of synthesizing the literature on domain adaptation. Um, and there's, you know, people have proposed many, many different methods for um, sort of learning features that are more likely to be robust over time in their model. And I've, I'll show you in a second, I've implemented many of these different methods that I have up here on the slide. But based on my reading of the literature, and I think maybe someone here is actually a co-author on this paper. And if so, I mean, I think this paper is super, super awesome. So I'm excited to meet you. Um, but it seems like based on some papers that have sought to benchmark how accurate these, how, how much these different uh, approaches to domain adaptation actually help in the wild, that a lot of these don't actually do that well on real world data sets. Um, and so I've been working lately on trying to think about sort of designing new approaches that are really specific to the PMT, proxy means test paradigm and the poverty targeting paradigm. In particular, because most of these methods from the domain adaptation literature seek mostly to address issues of model drift over time. They don't really deal with this fact that we are working with also data that's just like really out of date itself. And so we also need to deal with finding features, basically selecting for features that are themselves robust to changes over time. Um, so just as like a little teaser, I won't go into too much about how we're actually designing this method, but this is using data from Peru and showing Again, that you can see you know, over time on the x-axis in the years since the proxy means test has been updated, R squared for a traditional proxy means test is going steadily down over time uh, and targeting errors are going up, which is of course bad. Um, I, uh, none of the like sort of methods from the domain ad adaptation literature that I sought to implement seem to really help this problem. Some of them actually hurt it a bit, but looking at trying to uh, this sort of new approach, which I can, I can talk about a bit later or in, in meetings people are interested, to um, selecting stable features that are specifically not only uh, stable in terms of their relationship with poverty over time, but also stable themselves in terms of their actual values over time, seems to be starting to solve the problem of accuracy decay over time to some extent. Um, yeah, and this is like ongoing work, so again, very excited to chat about it if people are interested. Okay, I know we're basically at time, so. I'll stop there unless people have any pressing questions. Otherwise, I'll see you in one-on-one -on -one meetings and we can talk then. Thanks.